Looks like we've got participants jumping in and joining us as I speak. Um, I just wanted to first of all say my name is Callum Throgmorton. Thanks for coming to this uh, this webinar this afternoon. I believe you're really going to enjoy it. Um, I was just speaking with with Dr. Farina King, who's going to be our presenter, uh, and and uh, she and, and and Rebecca Hammond from from Crow Canyon were sharing some reminiscences of the boarding school. We've got a lot of personal connections uh, with this one in particular. Uh, so maybe some of you have connections to it as well, and, and you'll enjoy what we're about to uh, what we're about to listen to and learn. Uh, so the webinar is entitled Zilf Ya Ofta, The School Inside the Mountain, Diné Students Remembering Home at the Intermountain Indian Boarding School. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to mention that the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center uh, acknowledges the Pueblo, oops, excuse me there, acknowledges the Pueblo U Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache, people on whose traditional homelands this institution sits and upon which we work and reside, and many of them also work and reside here, our mission-related work would not be possible without Indigenous people in the past, present, and future. We respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant Indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all Indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions ancestral connections and sacred lands. And as I usually do, I like to point out that these land acknowledgements are, are, are useful and interesting to get us thinking, but they also are meant to push you to go and learn a little bit more about your own personal place uh, within the part of the country you reside. Uh, what are the histories of, 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 of settlers and indigenous people in that particular part of the country? Crow Canyon, uh, our mission is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. You can find out more about us on the internet if you go to crowcanyon.org. Uh, and our website has recently been updated. Uh, a lot of the same things are there, but you might find them in slightly different places. So it's uh, definitely worth taking a look and, and, and checking us out. I'll put in a plug that uh, the most recent annual report for our current excavation project at the Haney site just went live this week. So if any of you have been uh, uh, eagerly awaiting any of the results from that or the preliminary results, you can go check that out now. I'm guessing that many of us are quite familiar with Zoom at this point, but in case you're not, uh, here's a few little pointers. You can move the talking heads. You're most likely seeing me uh, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. You can move that around uh, if it's obscuring something that you wanna see from our presenter. Uh, if you're going to ask any questions that are specific to the subject matter that Dr. King's presenting on, you can pop those into the Q&A section. You'll find that button either at the very top or the very bottom of your screen, depending on uh, what your Zoom is like. Um, if you're having difficulties with Zoom, you can also catch us live streaming on Facebook. And usually uh, we record these and they will go up onto YouTube shortly there, uh, shortly after the presentation is ended. I think that we usually get those up either the evening of or the following day. Um, if you do want to just use the chat function, that's often just to share uh, conversations between participants. And you might also notice that we've got a, a closed captioning function at the, the bottom of the screen. I have noticed that the closed captioning often struggles with non-English words and uh, jargon that might get used in, uh, in archaeology and anthropology. So be forewarned, you might see things that aren't spelled quite the way you expect that they ought to be. Um, I want to cue you into a couple of upcoming webinars. Uh, of course, you can catch us here almost every Thursday afternoon at 4 p.m. Uh, coming up next week, uh, Thursday, February 17th, the Hisatsunom chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society will be presenting projectile points, chronology, and the Oshara tradition in the San Luis Valley uh, with Chris Johnston. Uh, I believe Chris was the, uh, the assistant uh, state archaeologist for a while. I think he's with Paleo Cultural Research Group now. Uh, that should be a really interesting one. Um, I, I personally have an interest in the Oshara tradition because I run into projectile points out of that tradition in New Mexico quite frequently. And then the following Thursday, February 24th, we have Out of the Ashes of Extinction, a Resurgent Nation is Reborn. The Hiased Otam and the Pursuit of Nationhood with Dr. David Martinez, 
Um, that's another one that I'm quite excited for. Uh, I'm really interested in these questions of sovereignty and how we think about what is a political entity and how they've come, um, how native nations try to find a place within the United States uh, or adjacent to uh, the United States. So that should be a very good one as well. So today's uh, presentation from Dr. Farina King, Zilsia Ota, The School Inside the Mountain. Um, one of the key things we're gonna get out of this is that during the early post-war period, the US government increased its efforts to facilitate schooling for Diné youth to abate an economic disaster. As Diné lost war-related employment and faced hardships such as the blizzard of 1947-1948. Emergency education schooling School programs became part of the solution under the overarching federal government approach of termination, assimilation as policies, and relocation. Federal government, federal officials pushed various initiatives to matriculate more school-aged Diné, funding more on-reservation and off-reservation educational programs. Terminationists, such as Senator Arthur Watkins, established the Intermountain Boarding School, Intermountain, in Brigham City, Utah, exclusively for Diné by 1950. In this context of the termination era, Intermountain, one of the largest federal Indian boarding schools in U.S. history, opened to pipeline Diné youth, the cities, away from their homelands. Uh, Dr. Farina King examines how Diné students challenge the termination agenda of Intermountain through creating their creative writing, visual arts, and development uh, of a global consciousness based on her co-authored book, Returning Home, with Michael P. Taylor and James R. Swenson. Intermountain students explored their identities and sustained their home communities as evinced in their writings, visual arts, and lasting interpersonal relationships. Their acts of remembering perpetuated their ties and returning home. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Farina King with us today. Uh, she's a citizen of the Navajo Nation, an associate professor of history, and an affiliated faculty of Cherokee and Indigenous Studies at Northeastern State University, Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Uh, she is also the director and founder of the NSU Center for Indigenous Community Engagement. Uh, she received her PhD at Arizona State University in U.S. History. King specializes in 20th century Native American studies, especially American Indian boarding school histories. She is the author of The Earth Memory Compass, Diné Landscapes and Education in the 20th Century, and co-author with Michael P. Taylor and James R. Swenson of Returning Home, Diné Creative Works from the Intermountain Indian School. And so I'm going to stop my screen share at this point and I'm gonna turn things over to Farina King. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much to, um, to the Crow Canyon Archeological Center. It was so nice to be able to meet you all, uh, especially Taylor for all the work she's done. Um, and uh, and uh, Caleb, who I just met, and um, Becky, I believe is what, what you go by, and uh, Hammond and, and the work she does with Indigenous Community Outreach. Thank you so much for including me, inviting me, and you all for joining us here and whatever time zone you're in, as in the virtual world, we're coming from so many different places. And, and thank you as well for indigenous land acknowledgement that we are all on indigenous lands and understanding that those histories and the interconnections, whether we're conscious of them or not, that we are navigating spaces that have been shaped by many indigenous people since time immemorial. Right now, um, I am in Jalagi country of the Cherokee Nation and United Katua Band of Cherokees and I, I'm very honored and grateful to be in this space and before them were Osage and many different um, indigenous peoples since time immemorial. I've shared uh, my bio. Um, a lot of people often, I don't include uh, the Diné way of introducing someone because uh, I was grateful Caleb was able to, uh, you know, pronounce Zif Ya Ota and some of the words that, that we're getting um, introduced to, if you don't know Dene Bazad, and I'm learning Dene Bazad, Dene Bazad Bihosh A. So to uh, relatives and kin out there, um, I'm also, wa I want to introduce myself in Dene way of uh, our clans, Dene She'e Bilagana Nishle, 
do kia ani bashish chin, vilagana dasha che, do synergini dasha nole, akut ego at sa nishle, um, telequa de shahan, Northeastern State University de nash nish, tonenez dizi, shadish che. So I just um, shared my, my clans and my family calling out to my relations there that I am of English American settler descent on my mother's, uh, through my mother and born for the Towering House clan and Black Street Woods people clans of Diné and a citizen of the Navajo Nation as mentioned before. So because of that background, um, I am a boarding school survivor descendant. And I tell people that um, because it's really hit me harder than ever in these past several months since we've heard in news and media about the unmarked mass graves of children, of uh, boarding school youth and in First Nations country of Canada and in North, other parts of North America, including the United States and a friend of mine, Marsha Small, has been using ground penetrating radar in the Chamawa Indian uh, boarding school grounds where even one of my uncles worked after uh, serving as a World War II co-talker, Albert Smith. So all these connections we have, these interconnections and talking you know, to Becky earlier of her family ties to Intermountain and these schools, it shows you know, we're not far removed from, from these connections. And my father went to the Fort, India, uh, Fort Wingate Indian boarding school in New Mexico and also Rama dormitory. And he told me um, in different parts of my life would tell different stories. They come in little pieces here and there, but it sparked my curiosity, sparked um, my passion and insp inspiration to study and understand and listen to boarding school stories uh, where, where, I, where I would come across or connect with them, with different people I'd meet and friends and family, you know, that, that we connected. And my father shared how um, he tried once to run away and with another little boy and they ran into a storm um, and almost died, froze to death, if it was um, not for a rancher just happened to come by and find them and pick them up. So like I said before, it really hit me making these connections that my father could have been an unmarked grave. And I would not be here with you today if he did not literally survive boarding school. So this is where um, I've come from my positionality to uh, these conversations and this learning journey. And um, my parents have lived in Monument Valley um, for some time recently in Sebi in the sky. And in that Southern part of Diné Pequeya, Navajo country, um, many people had some connection to Intermountain or, or went there. So it was also at, at that time too, I started to make more connections to Intermountain specifically and was able to meet um, so many people who it's just our connections and linkage, linkages that brought this work and this ongoing work going, going on, you know, as it is um, together. And Mike Taylor, my friend at Brigham Young University and James Swenson, a colleague at BYU as well. And I'm here in uh, Cherokee Nation country at Northeastern State University, founded by the Cherokee Nation after forced removal and was technically a boarding school, but a boarding school founded by the Cherokee and uh, for Cherokee women and men that they had a, a seminary for women and a seminary for men. So boarding schools are very complicated. There's not one story of a boarding school, although we can see the... Um, layers and parallels and interconnections. But this, this work, I'm going to share this uh, insight and experiences, but it really is an opening. It's a tip of the iceberg. Uh, just as I'm talking with more people who um, have family or relations or meeting alumni from the last 10 years that Intermountain was open 
It was open from about 1950 to 1984. And the first 20 years or so, it was Navajo only who went there. And then it became an intertribal boarding school in its last 10 years, 1974 to 1984. We focused heavily on the origins of the school and the early uh, couple decades. And so there's still a lot of work in also hearing about um, the transition into becoming a, in an intertribal school and the different experiences of indigenous students there. So like I said, this is really an opening, but it was my work with my first book, The Earth Memory Compass and Oral Histories, especially with Diné boarding school survivors, um, former students, that I, I continued this work of looking at the Ne experiences at an off-reservation school in Brigham City. So the image you see um, to the side of me that I'm going to zoom in on is one of the murals that were saved um, from the grounds of the Intermountain Indian Boarding School. And I mean, this picture doesn't even do it justice. It is astounding, just so beautiful in person. It covers, you know, walls. It, um, it was one of the murals and there, there were several, you know, not just one like this, but done by um, different artists, uh, some from different tribal nations, especially into the later uh, 10 years, but the first 20 years, uh, Diné only, and a lot of uh, Diné, themes and landscapes in the images. And as I said, when Intermountain closed by 1984, the buildings mostly sat there and were falling apart into disarray, um, you know, basically rotting, right? And just falling uh, into, yeah, a mess. And eventually, um, the buildings were demolished, most of them. There's a few standing there uh, to this day in Brigham City. And some might know about the eye on the side of the mountain in Brigham City that, that stands for Inner Mountain. And even just last fall, September, uh, alumni gathered. I was able to go as well. And we had a panel of hearing voices and stories um, about Inner Mountain in Brigham City, where Utah State University has built a satellite campus on the grounds where uh, the or original boarding school, Inner Mountain, stood. Before that, it was a Bushnell military hospital that was transformed into the boarding school and a really large campus with a pool, a cafeteria, all these different things. But a lot of these murals were actually lost, like destroyed. But um, there were some trespassers or different people who were interested who came onto the grounds, took photos before a lot of uh, the murals and, and different parts of the buildings were bulldozed. One of those individuals we have been preserved for memory and sharing is Brad Peterson, who um, saved some and, and restored some murals that we featured in an exhibit as Mike and James and I, before we wrote the book, we actually came together uh, with the idea of an interdisciplinary project of creating a traveling exhibit that would primarily do just what the title of the book um, embodies, return home the creative works of students, Diné students primarily, um, that they did while away from home at Inner Mountain between you know, the 1950s and 1984. And the traveling exhibit uh, went to different communities that we were trying to be sure had ties to Diné and Native American uh, populations and community. And uh, connecting with the vibrant and active Inner an alumni and their Navajo alumni, they have been meeting regularly, annually in the summer in Navajo Nation in wheat fields. And it was through this descendants and relations connections that we made that we uh, were able to meet and, and work with Intermountain alumni who have are pretty, you know, they are organized and they organize these reunions and gatherings regularly. There's also an interactive intertribal alumni, and that's the group that came together, including Navajo, but um, students from many tribal nations that came together in Brigham City last fall of 2021. 
Um, and so, you know, like I said, this work has so many people I have to recognize. I can't list them all. They are all in our, our acknowledgements. There's so many um, that this work has depended on. It would not have been possible, this book, without all these people coming together, especially my partners, uh, Mike Taylor and James Swenson. Uh, one of them is out of the country right now. And, um, we, but we certainly stay in touch and try to work on different initiatives together. And I don't know how well you can see um, what was listed in the corner there, but um, going to the Navajo Nation Historic Preservation Office, um, Ojeto chapters, some specific uh, Diné community chapters that we brought um, parts of the exhibit that were able to travel because some of the pieces are very fragile and delicate, um, but uh, we were able to bring the exhibit. Our, our main goal was bringing it to the Navajo Nation Museum that we did. Um, and that exhibit left there in March of 2020, right before the major outbreaks of the COVID-19 pandemic that has certainly hit our um, indigenous communities and the Navajo Nation very hard, including my, my family. And my father who um, had, had been a physician with the U Utah Navajo Health System in Monument Valley at the time I was working with this project and especially uh, bringing, um, working to listen to the stories and with oral histories of Intermountain alumni. And Dene went to Intermountain from all different parts of Dene Pequeya. And I know you all in the Cortez area must be familiar with how vast you know, the Navajo Nation is and, and the diverse communities within Navajo Nation. So we still have much work to do with reaching these different communities because many of the students came from uh, these various communities and areas and brought you know, their ties of home with them and how they sustained their connections to home while at, uh, at Zif Yaota, the school with inside the mountain Inner Mountain Indian School. And of course, many sponsors, many su supporters like the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at BYU that funded the traveling exhibit um, primarily and our affiliated institutions like NSU, BYU, Utah Humanities, so many people who came together and contributors to the work that we have Diné Bazad, Navajo language um, portions in the book, or original pieces written by Rena Dunn that translate the main messages we want to convey uh, with the book. And um, Robert Dodson, the Intermountain alumni um, president who also wrote the foreword, Terrence Ride, a student. We had many students supporting us and researchers. And as mentioned before, you know, it, it was the idea first to have this exhibit because of actually a digital collection that Utah State University being another important contributor, you know, partner with this work that um, Utah State University has been the caretaker of significant archives of these student creative writings, poetry, artwork. And when the cl school closed, you know, these collections of student works and different sources like photographs um, went to Utah State University's special collections and archives, and they did an incredible, uh, incredible work at digitizing those different materials. But when um, it was Mike Taylor and one of his students, Terrence Ride, who brought that to my attention, asking, "Hey, did you know there's all these materials about Intermountain? We'd like to uh, look at them more and understand them more." And I said, "You know what?" How much do you know the actual alumni know about these different materials? Can the community access it? And I mean, certainly in the pandemic, it's been very upfront. And um, I hope my internet isn't too unstable. I'm at home, so excuse me if I kind of flicker or not. Um, but it it certainly came to the attention of the disparity and the inequalities of access to internet, even if something you know, is digitized and people can see it, do they 
are they really aware and know how to access it and be able to access it? So that's where, you know, this collaboration and all the networking started going, started getting going um, with Mike and James coming on as, as he, James is an art historian and had the experience with preparing art exhibits and then us working with uh, and connecting with Intermountain alumni and community. And it was the Intermountain uh, alumni who asked us, will you write a book? You know, we really want something to pass on to our posterity, to our community. And so that's what motivated us to prepare this book, returning home and working with our wonderful publisher, the University of Arizona Press and all the great folks there who, who worked with us and could you know, see the vision and, and really uh, help us along, along this path. And so that's kind of the origins of the book. And even um, the cover image, as you see here, is one of the pieces that James, I mean, it really was a gathering of learning about where are all these different student sources? They were not, and materials, they were not just all in the Utah State University archives. They were in people's attics, you know, in their own um, family boxes in the garage or, or different places. And even with Utah State, some of those murals were in storage. They were not digitized. They were not being shown. And so it was also this uncovering, like unerasing this history too and connecting um, and so the image on the cover is uh, by Robert Chi, who was one of the Intermountain students who identified, who thought, who um, identified as an artist professionally. And that was actually uncommon. Most students who went to Intermountain, even if they wrote poetry, they painted um, or, you know, did these different arts, they went on to become an electrician, had other uh, vocations that they pursued or were taught, of course, emphasized at Inner Mountain. So the image, you know, really became iconic of the themes and what we wanted to convey and support with this project is clearly, you know, the image of a family and the Nay family together, looking like they're going home together, wherever they're going home is wherever they are together. And that students, like Robert Chi, we're doing this kind of work at Inner Mountain when there's so much trauma, as I mentioned, you know, even my own in my own family and all these experiences um, that that people for some are being introduced to, but among the Na and, and Native American families, you know, these are stories we carry, we we've lived with, even if we're not fully aware of all the aspects of it. So that's how it was so important. Um, that image to us and honor to, to feature it. This is a map of Dene Vikeya for those who uh, might be less familiar with it. I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of you are aware, especially if you're in the Cortez area and, and recognize that two of Dene sacred mountains, Zif and Diyin, are in that region not far from you, right? Of um, Cisna Jene and Deben Sa. And this, um, point of, of what I meant in my first book, The Earth Memory Compass of, this is a Dene compass of the four directions from east, south, west, north, Ha'a'a, Shada'a, um, E'e'a, and Nahokos, and that the each of the sacred mountains affiliated with them, that's home, that is home to Dene. And where all these students are coming from, that's that's what home is and, and where family and our origins, you know, the origin stories and, and oral traditions are, are tied to, to give a sense to that. And then they're going all the way, you know, hundreds of miles being sent and on buses, especially to go to Brigham City in Northern Utah to this mega boarding school. And that, you know, this is just from Monument Valley to Brigham City and other students were coming from even farther, further away, like Tonanez Dizze, Tuba City, um, Crown Point, you know, other different parts of Dine country. And so just to give you a sense of this was far, you know, the journey they had to take and, and being away from home and, and um, why I called this book title, I mean, this talk title, Zif Ya Ota, 
is that's what Danae called Inner Mountain, the, the school inside the mountain. And one of the students, Ben Nez, that I talked to told me about how when he heard that, that he was going to Zif Ya'ota, he was imagining like a school literally inside a cave, you know, it's inside this mountain and, and was, uh, you know, kind of shaken by that thinking, what am, where are we going to? What am, what should I expect? You know, and it was, like entering a whole different terrain and different landscape and how, you know, that, that shapes or affects a person's orientation. And I appreciate Kalon's succinct, very concise summary, you know, an introduction to the different, you know, the context and, and what I'm sharing in this presentation that he mentioned the origins of Inner Mountain, right? That you see um, this image here is a newspaper clipping from 1947. Kalem referred to that um, ac economic crisis, but it was a crisis on, on so many levels of uh, episode of, of dire straits and circumstances in Navajo Nation after World War II. And the call and pleas that are being recorded in that kind of newspaper article is uh, Sam Akia, who was serving as the title then was the chairman of the Navajo Tribal Council. He was Dene leader. He was calling for help um, because Dene families were starving. They were desperate. In the time of this horrible blizzard of 1947, families could not feed themselves and they were risking the dangers of the blizzard to even come to his home in wagons or whatever they had and begging him for food, work, you know, to eat. And it was just really horrible, horrible conditions and, and different struggles that the people had. Why so, you know, well, World War II certainly transformed Diné and the world, um, but most Americans just think of the economic boom and pos uh, prosperity in the United States at the time when it was actually quite opposite for Navajo Nation when um, you know, there's a loss of the jobs that were offered in ammunition factories and these warfare industries, veterans are returning home after, of course, the trauma of being in war, but then not having you know, the opportunities of education and jobs in the Nefikeya. And you know, my own uncles, my relatives were uh, a part of that, uh, facing those challenges and struggles. And as I mentioned before, you know, why emergency education is schools were seen as a survival strategy, an outlet, a way to survive. And, it, and there was a change in the mentality of how Diné saw schools. But unfortunately, it also came at the time of, um, as we show in this image here, the time of these policies, you know, that I'm highlighting here. Um, let me skip actually ahead and I'll come back to that one. Policies like HCR 108 in 1953 of uh, termination to end Native American status as wards of the United States. That was the rhetoric, but termination was to disintegrate tribal nations and absorb them into the hegemonic United States. And Senator Arthur Watkins of Utah was a prominent terminationist. And um, Warren Mitcalf's work looks at uh, termination in Utah specifically and how Watkins was a major part of that. And it was Watkins' idea to um, open Inner Mountain. And why so is, um, you know, you have this collision, the convergence of Dene are saying we need something, you know, just to survive. And it's after World War II when over 50% of Dene school age children are not going to school. They don't have access to a school. And in the sense of these Eurocentric modeled school systems. And so then the US government also sees that as, as an issue saying, all right, well, maybe you know they can be trained to have jobs, they can have opportunities. And that goes hand in hand with their ideas and their agenda to relocate 
to disintegrate tribal sovereignty and the status of these federally recognized tribal nations and integrate them into dominant or so-called mainstream American society. And the relocation programs, you know, that are also referred to here, like Indian Relocation Act of 1956, to pipeline them, as, as Kalem said, you know, into the cities. And Inner Mountain was envisioned in that context. And why Diné would be open to it is it was Navajo emergency education. And they saw, well, this is a kind of negotiation of Diné to, you know, survive these very difficult times. And maybe, you know, education can be wielded, used in the favor and support of Diné Bikeya and Navajo people. So even, you know, though, Navajo leaders were willing to work with um, these American governmental officials like Watkins to open and send Navajos specifically to that school because it was the so-called Navajo problem of this hardship and, and all these different dynamics. Um, to terminationists, they were seeing it differently uh, in their idea of, oh, this is perfect. You know, we need to assimilate Navajos. They have to be civilized. You know, I mean, these are the kind of language and rhetoric that actually is being, it's, it's a continuation of boarding schools that date back, you know, to years, generations before. And what most people are familiar with are the stories of the Carlisle Industrial Indian Institute and uh, the founder of that, Richard Henry Pratt, and his notorious uh, idea and plan to kill the Indian and save the man in him, you know, that, that language. And though Inner Mountain was very different, it came in a whole nother era and it would change over the decades that it was open, it still originated from the assimilationist agenda, the plan to detach indigenous youth from their homelands, and in this case, the Ne. And that's how the US government, you know, in this language, Krug, who was, um, let me zoom in here so you can see, Krug was working with the Department of Interior at the time. He uh, was a part of investigating the so-called Navajo problem and um, pushed for a permanent resettlement, thought that you know, Navajo life in the Nebuchadnezzar, Navajo homelands was unsustainable and wanted to remove them. And then, you know, there's these other policies that were able to fund and get the school off the ground. So a lot happening in all that. And what you see in that image that I also had featured in my first book was the idea that, you know, education is the future, that that's the hope. And you have to send your children away to school, away from home to, for, you know, for the sake of the people. But then this image here, you know, that you've already seen some time, for some time now, is by Robert Curley, an Inner Mountain student, and he's looking into the clouds, you know, seeing the skyscrapers, and we're starting to think about, well, how does this really affect Diné youth? What are they thinking? How are they processing this? They are not just, you know, blank slates to be written over, and that's what this work of Diné, uh, creative works and returning home is getting at, is it's not these linear journeys from point A to B of, you know, students went to Inner Mountain and, and this is what happened there. But I see it as very much cyclical in a Dene way of teachings of San Nagai Bik Ehajon, walk in beauty. And it's this constant restoration of harmony of Hajo beauty, which, you know, you can't ever really fully translate. And in this sense, the Nay students are also experiencing cycles of, while being away from home, many of them do return home, even if they don't do so physically, they do so through their art, through other ways. And that's really powerful in this work. And I'm going to try and talk about this, you know, with, with the sensitivity, sensitivities and, and just, you know, the chords it strikes with me when I talk about it. Um, but these are images of the kind of materials that Utah State University archives and special collections had preserved and digitized. And a lot of them were these student booklets, you know, full books 
piece of poetry, um, a public a student publication titled Rainbow and Dene Bazad, not Silid. And um, some students were very prolific, you know, like Archie Washburn, who I was able to meet and, and talk to at one of the Inner Mountain reunions and Henry Tinhorn had their own full books of poetry. And this is one of the pieces by Archie Washburn that we quote in the book. And we mainly, you know, we feature these different creative student works and expressions um, and in a sense are continuing to curate them and include the Ned Bazad Navajo language parts as well that Rena Dunn and one of my past Dene language instructors, Juliana Begay Krupa helped with. But so you're seeing here, um, Archie's, one of Archie's poems, I'll read to you briefly. Beautiful colored red land, red rocks standing like statues. Wind from the north, low sandstorm to the bright sun. Rain from the clear blue sky pours. The thirsty plants once more howl in the rain with joy. Only I stood in the rain with wet skin while through the thundering noise, a lightning zigzag with pain. Only if I could roar with pain like that, but I can't for my Navajo land is where I grew up. Navajo land with beautiful colored flowers that make me gay. Navajo land stood up through ages of my ancestors. Abstracting sound. So those kind of works, you know, really resonated with us as we were thinking about Archie's writing that in the 70s while he's away at Inner Mountain and he's evoking Dene Bikeya. He's evoking home, the very place that individuals like Watkins, Krug, you know, these American officials were planning and trying to de devise ways to cut off Dene from. And Archie he, he wasn't ever like officially, uh, he didn't list his job as a poet. He went on to become an electrician and he returned to Dene Bikeya, to his hometown, home area of Shiprock. And this is an image of him. And the thoughts, you know, that really struck me was how he emphasized um, one of these days, my people, my children, will know that I am a poet, a writer. And that's a picture of him um, while he was a student at Inner Mountain. You know, as you can tell, an image showing him reading, uh, that he was really engaging with this literature. And I think that was really powerful that Mike emphasized with his um, contributions to this work and the students was these works, we think high school poetry, we might dismiss that or say, oh, these boarding school writings, you know, they were under surveillance and, and they're very filtered. But these are works that also stand on their own, are remarkable. And the students um, participated in national competitions that involved other very uh, noteworthy indigenous authors, and they are contributing to indigenous literature, as well as to sustaining and, and enriching their own uh, cultures and people of the Nebikeya. So it's very powerful, you know, in, in these types of connections that are happening here. Some of the poems that also stood out to me that are, are featured in the book are even just short short expressions of what students are experiencing, you know, that they are being critical or, you know, calling out in the struggles and challenges that they're facing at the boarding school. One student here, um, Susan Josea, wrote sitting in the hot day and night, hoping that the family would come back for a visit just only for a week or two. So I could hear the children playing, the smelling of the fried bread, hearing the bell of the bill goat, kids, lambs playing about the rocks. It's lonely, it's all alone in the hot and cold days. And then one here by Anita Thomas, past months being in cold climate and seeing snow every day, makes me wonder a lot about my family. I wonder who brings water back from a mile for them. And you know, these were really um, 
striking to me because it shows while they're away, you know, they're thinking about what they're seeing, that they are in inner mountain with this snowy, you know, the mountains. And the image there is from a friend of mine, Jared Tamez, who's in northern Utah, you know, those kind of ranges up on um, in, in that part. Um, and the students are, are facing that cold and yet, you know, thinking and, and worrying about home and worrying, you know, that they are being missed and how they could be contributing to home and the family. Watching time, I want to be sure, you know, there's time for some questions and comment, especially acknowledging Inner Mountain family that are with us today or those who went there themselves. I, I will unfortunately have to be quick going through these next slides and wrap up. So we have time to hear uh, your thoughts and questions you have for me. But as I mentioned before, another um, prolific student poet was uh, Henry Tinhorn. And the pieces that he had were certainly very critical um, and insightful, analytical, in such a way that um, Mike wrote an article about him. Uh, he, we had interviewed um, a former teacher, Alexa Aho West, who was actually Henry Tinhorn's teacher, and she admitted that um, she was worried. I know in talking to former teachers, one of the teachers had said she was worried he was cheating because she just couldn't believe how um, you know intricate the language was and everything. And um, the teachers were trying to petition, you know, to support the writing programs at Intermountain. And one of the administrators said a very dismissive statement of Indians can't write sonnets. And Henry Tinhorn, you know, he just completely debunked that. And Mike has an article about that that is just a wonderful piece. Um, but this was one of Tinhorn's poems that resonated especially with me, um, thinking about, again, the four mountains and what they mean, what they signify to Diné, you know, ancestral teachings, epistemologies, these ways of knowing. Mountains lament. Where are my people? The mountains cry out. I've seen them play and live in my hands, and I felt them run the trail of my back. Before the sleepy winter came, I heard their laughter ring out and fill the valleys with joy. Now there's only the sounds of silence, where once a baby had talked in meaningless sentences. Mr. Sun, you've traveled. Do you know where my people are? A drop of golden sunshine was the answer. Have you seen my people? The mountains asked the sky, but the rains came and that was the sky's reply. And that for me, you know, was um, thinking about how my uncle would say, Albert would say the church, uh, the mountain is my church and all, you know, the powerful meanings of mountains that listening and reading and, and envisioning Tin Horn's words here of the mountain is crying out for her children, that they are missing, they are gone. And um, that yet there's also still hope. To e ina, water is life. And that rain is not a sign of um, like sorrow or sadness and mourning, though it has all these connections too of cleansing and hope, sehasin. So that, you know, is the kind of work that's just very powerful. And talking, you know, back about the arts, unfortunately, we won't have as much time to delve into all these pieces, but certainly looking at them, just looking at them of what are the students, you know, in these different media, mediums of line of cuts, um, the paintings, whether it's acrylic, watercolor, what are they depicting? You know, these are the types of pieces that, that we had. And one image, you know, that's that's really uh, stands out is the wagon. You know, what is why is there this image of the wagon, and what does that mean to Dene? Rena Dixon um, was another student I was able to talk to, and this was a painting she did at, after her time at Inner Mountain. But uh, when I was talking to her about her experiences and memories, I realized a very strong connection, uh, that word keeps coming up, is uh, she shared how her mother passed away when she was young and her fond memories are riding in the wagon with her family to the trading post uh, for different things, you know, 
And then she remembered as well when her, after her mother passed away, she went, um, her family signed her up to go to Inner Mountain and they would drop her off in the wagon and she would watch them driving away as in this image. And she expressed, you know, the kind of loneliness and yearning that she had. Um, yet she went on, you know, to do really well in her classes. She even mentioned that she took classes with Alan Hauser, the famous Chiricahua Apache artist who actually was key to starting the arts program at Intermountain. And she expressed gratitude for how he encouraged them in expressing their Native American identity through their arts and work, which just gets at that resiliency and these kind of everyday acts of resurgence, you know, that scholars like Jeff Korntassel have talked about. And as I mentioned, still so much, you know, to do uh, with intertribal experiences and um, all kinds of experiences at Inner Mountain, some that are very dark and the students who did not survive schools like Inner Mountain and what are their stories that we always remember them. This is an image of Zig Jackson, a well-known Mandan Hadatsa Arikara artist who also went to Inner Mountain and James was able to connect, meet, um, talk to him and get insights from him that are included in parts in the book. Um, and that he, you know, went on to really, again, challenge, you know, um, shake up these ideas of, of what maybe these schools assimilationist agendas were or the place of Native Americans in society as images like his photograph there, you know, start to get at. And um, this last image here, one of the last images here is of a dear a friend of mine, uh, Shiyaje, I'll call him my little, um, it's actually Shiyaje, like my, my uncle here, Jesse Holiday. Um, I call him uncle because he's become family through kinship, you know, eh, our kinship and such. Um, he was a, a good friend, is a good friend of our families from um, Sebi in the sky, Monument Valley. And that's one of his pieces in watercolor as depicting the Nebikeya, his home. And he told me um, how he really started to pick up art while in boarding school and art pulled him out of his times of anxiety, of loneliness. He says that art is what was a way of getting him through. And that image that I showed you was uh, where one of the different activities and events we do is not only the exhibit, but we went to Sebi in Disguy Elementary School in his community. And um, Jesse went to lots of different schools, different programs, and eventually he came home to the, ne the Nebikeya and he was able to teach art in Navajo schools there. Um, community area schools and silversmithing and even some, you know, Navajo traditional arts until, um, you know, he would eventually retire and he did suffer a stroke. So we see him now, you know, in, um, unable to paint. And it was really a powerful moment to share his work, share these stories with children who called him Che, grandfather, and respect him and honor him. And um, seeing him, you know, really brought to tears of how grateful he is, where he said, I didn't think I was doing anything, but through his work, you know, it is this sustaining, it is the perpetuation of Diné culture and people and recognizing the students who do that. And these people who have become so, so very dear to me, um, who are in my heart always in my mind, and carrying their stories and memories that I share with you. Thank you for listening. And I really look forward to more conversation about this. There is much work, much to do in, a, in not only recognizing these boarding school stories, but now what do we do? What do we teach our children? Who has control over education, over the curriculum? And what our children and families go through and how important it is even to this day, 
Navajo Nation and many indigenous nations are struggling and facing challenges over self-determination and indigenous educational sovereignty. So, and even the Intermountain alumni, you know, as I mentioned, when they gathered together in um, Brigham City, they had to save up, they had to fundraise, they had to really, you know, face hoops to be able to gather and have those moments of healing. So I hope that you all also stay in touch and support in the best ways uh, our communities. Ahihe, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Farina. That was very informative, very touching, uh, and really began to reveal aspects of boarding school life that I'm not sure uh, were necessarily common knowledge to a lot of us who aren't intimately familiar with that, that world. Um, we do have a few questions that are, that are rolling in at the moment. Um, I might start with a couple of, uh, well, maybe they're deceptively simple, but just asking, were, um, are, are students, were they writing entirely in English? Was that part of the way the curriculum was structured that they're not really able to write in their, their own language? Mm -hmm. Great question. And, um, you know, that's actually a first, I've, you know, I've presented and talked to people about this. Most of it was in English. So, I mean, this is a part of as well, you know, how much um, translation language and one of the most horrific impacts of boarding schools whether you know some students are even nostalgic of their time there they see it as very foundational to who they are while others you know are certainly con condemning of it and decrying you know what happened at the boarding school and the kind of abuses and dark episodes that happened there dark darkness of of that experience um and i think a very horrific impact as i was mentioning is on language that an underlying message even though um, students could, you know, especially when it was the net only for the first couple of decades, they spoke in Navajo to each other. They had, you know, Navajo classmates and could, could continue to perpetuate the language in that way. And they, there was not that same kind of um, pressure stories we hear in the earlier boarding schools of mouth, uh, soap in the mouth if they hear them speak the Navajo language or another, you know, an indigenous language or the kind of very harsh corporal, corporal punishment for that, you know, that um, you don't have as, as prevalent those kind of stories. I'm not saying that was not possible because you also have a horrible underlying message of English is a priority language, uh, the idea, the false idea that the Nebazad would hold them back. And so even when you, I meet, you know, two Dene parents who went to boarding school, they're not teaching their children the Navajo language. And it's really an uphill battle and struggle to continue Navajo language. So, you know, the students um, mostly were writing in English. That's what they were practicing in. But there are cases where they sprinkle they mix in some Dene Bazad words and certainly Dene uh, concepts like Hajo that they might call happiness. And what's also very powerful, you know, I love <laughs> saying that, and I haven't brought this up as much before in conversations about this. And even in the book itself, I think there's more to look into uh, for sure is that um, oral tradition Students, a number of the students, these creative writings they're writing are oral histories. They're writing histories that they heard from their families. Stories like uh, Henry Tinhorn shared one of, I think, a grandmother. I, I would have to, you know, I'm just trying to recall here. I know I'm on, on record and everything. So please excuse me if off the bat, I can't remember exact details, but the book has it of he's sharing a story of, a, of an ancestor's survival and the kind of violence she survived when there were um, the enslavers, individuals coming and killing, massacring Dene people. And this is even after the forced removal uh, to Awafte, the long walk that Dene suffered. 
um, and, and that there's still cycles of violence happening in the area. And he shares a family history. And that was, you know, shared in English, but it is an important, you know, history that, that is in writing from, from the student and these kind of connections. And there's other, you know, shared Diné teachings and oral histories that students share. But um, in terms of writing in the language, you know, that that is still that underlying message of the assimilationist agenda of, you know, stress English and not teaching like Diné Bazad language classes, which now that's in the effort of language vitalization and the revitalization movements and resurgence happening. And that's why, you know, we worked with interpreters and translators like Rena Dunn, Juliana Begay Krupa, and my father, Dr. Phil Smith, to bring in Navajo language parts of telling this story. Because I will say this, um, one thing that really I know Mike and James, my co-authors would mention, and, and they talk about it in the book, is when they went to the Intermountain Reunion in Wheatfields and Navajo Nation, everything, most of the announcements and they had um, a microphone, you know, like events happening and uh, basically an open mic. And uh, most of it, uh, or at least half of it was in Diné Bazad in Navajo language. So here are these guys who, <laughs> and they, they're my buddies. Um, but they, you know, heard Navajo boarding school stories of soap in the mouth for language, you know, of trying to eradicate language at boarding schools. And they're coming to a boarding school reunion in the heartland of the Nebikeya, a Navajo country, and hearing Navajo language everywhere. And that's how the students are relating and sharing their stories. So I know um, there's Dr. Um, uh, Lloyd Lee at the University of New Mexico, and he was doing an oral history project with Intermountain alumni because he is a descendant, um, and he was seeking to really pursue doing that in Diné Bazad, and there's much need of continuing oral histories in Navajo language and in the respective indigenous languages, because there's so much you just, you cannot translate it. It's very important in that work. So thank you for that question. <laughs> um, a few folks are also just curious, and this is probably a pretty simple one, is when, well, maybe it's not, when did the Navajo language uh, develop a written orthography? When did people start figuring out um, how to, you know, if students are trying to write some of these things within the Diné language, um, where, where does that come from? Yeah. Oh, so I am not, you know, a historian of, uh, the Navajo language, but of course, like in my different studies and just personal family experiences of, of stories and everything. I mean, even today, you know, my father, he, Navajo is his first language and I'm, you know, that for me is something very painful, right. About this story of, even asking my father, why didn't you ever teach us Navajo language, you know? And he'll say, you never asked. But the more I learn these stories of the hardship he faced, the different experiences, including his runaway experience of almost dying, I, you know, have to connect the dots and say there's something deeper here. Um, so in terms of my father even working with me as a Navajo translator interpreter, he's saying things and Navajo, you have to understand is traditionally, it is an oral language. It did not have you know, an intricate uh, writing system or like their own kind of um, writing, uh, writing system, <laughs> as I know I'm sounding repetitive here, or even like Cherokee that uh, Sequoia who drafted the Cherokee syllabary, you know, Navajo did not have that. So they're using uh, you know, they're basically adopting a Latin based um, alphabet and like the writing system and trying to, you know, adapt it to this oral language. And it's not, you know, it's really hard. It's not the perfect fit, right? Because you're taking a writing system of a whole nother language that's very different and trying, it's like the writing itself is translation, translation, like layer upon layer. Um, so 
where the Navajo language, I would say, started to really start to be written. And the reason why, you know, this has come into my memory or experience, like in, in just interacting with, with my Diné family and Diné studies is I remember, as I mentioned, two of my uncles, not only one, I mentioned Albert, my uncle Albert, but my uncle George was also a Navajo code talker. And if you think about it, why was the Navajo code the, uh, considered the only unbreakable military code? And why is Navajo language like seen as so different and untranslatable, you know, by so many different peoples or other peoples? Is it, it is because in a sense of its obscurity, at least from the rest of the world, like Japan during the war or the Axis powers, right? And so at the time of the, even the war in the 1940s, you know, the written formatting or whatever in Navajo language, it wasn't really standardized. It wasn't really set even by then. And that was to the advantage of applying the Navajo language as a military code in World War II. And so this is recent, you know, a lot of this is recent when you think about that um, and that over the years, it's still an ongoing debate as many languages are of, of what, what happens when you do standardize them after Diné College was established, you know, in the late 20th century and they start Diné language programs and they have language tests of proficiency and that's creating a drive you know, to standardize the language more and kind of create the, a more, yeah, that standardized and in a sense, more like a dominant push of what is seen as, as official Navajo language. So this is, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation and a lot of uh, sources to dig into, um, but thank you. This, these are important conversations because, um, you know, different communities, I had, this comes out, especially in oral history too, of, some people I meet who are Dene, when I say hajo, they're like, how dare you say it like that? It's wajo, you know, and there's the differences and like pronunciation. And then how do you write that? Like, how is that translated? So that's continuing to this day of those differences and, and what's happening as Navajo language is being you know, prepared in Rosetta Stone and these textbooks. And now if students want the Manuelito scholarship, you know, they need to have a proficiency and take classes in Navajo language. But what, what's all like the qualifications and aspects of that? Well, it seems like that's a continuing political yeah. thing as well of like who gets to be the, the deciders of that yeah. at, the, uh, at the moment. Um, yeah. Some folks have been wondering a little bit more about the social contexts of these uh, of boarding schools in general. And I'm at the question is, could parents visit their kids uh, at these schools in any way? Actually, yes, they could. So at Intermountain um, and I, I, oh, I can't you know, I didn't have the bookmark in it. But one of the, the poems I had read before, I think it was even. I thought it was that one I mentioned earlier, actually. She mentions that she wishes her family would visit. I don't know if you remember um, that phrase in it. I thought it was, if I can get it back up. Oh no, because I'm trying to see if it will go, if I got it. So this language, she says, hoping that the family would come back for a visit. Yes. So that's Susan Josea. You know, even in these poems themselves, they are saying sometimes families would come visit and they could have, you know, that visitation, but it's hard, you know, it's expensive and family oh, fight and struggle. So some students, you know, they wouldn't go home at all. You know, they couldn't even get back home or different situations that were going on at home and some would be away years at a time. What kind of condition is the, uh, the the Intermountain Boarding School in today? Is there still a structure there? As an archaeologist, I'm always intrigued by the you know yeah. material presences these things leave. Is this a place you can go? You know, if people visited it, it would have powerful emotional uh, kind of effect on folks. Yes. So thanks to Utah State again um, for they created an outdoor um, walking 
exhibit tour where you can, um, and it has QR codes and some different plaques. And that actually was done recently in the last couple of years. And it's a nice uh, paved walk and um, you can walk along and they feature, you know, aspects of their digital collection. So I do say, you know, visitors can go by and they can go along that walking tour. And if you have your smartphone, you know, or device, it can use those QR codes to link to more virtual exhibits. So yes, you know, most of the buildings were bulldozed and sadly there were some more precious murals you know that that were destroyed in that and fortunately you know some photos were taken i do know there is a photographer an artist um, writer who's working on a book like there's different projects in the works where she is addressing more of that that kind of approach in terms of material, you know, in a sense, an archaeological uh, dynamic, because she's looking at how the, the land has changed over time. And she was um, an individual who went into uh, the grounds and took, I don't know, hundreds of photos of the walls, because she caught uh, images, like she took photos of the walls where students would draw things on the walls. So, you know, a lot of the collections we're looking at, they were published student works by the school, but there were other, you know, um, these more clandestine, you know, kind of forms of student expression that, that she took images of and mm -hmm. is working on a project about that. And then also I've talked about how, you know, the homelands of being Shoshone, Shoshone and Ute lands, and then a boarding school that brings in other students coming in, a military hospital of World War II, and in Diné culture among peoples, you know, the idea of being in a place where people died and that kind of, um, that those kind of situations were happening. I think most of the students weren't even aware of that background or what that would have caused, you know, with those kind of dynamics. So certainly a lot, you know, to look in the place. There is, um, there are a few original buildings still standing and one is a very small one that th this is an important, um, thank you, an important point to bring up because I've, I've been talking to different committees and I'm hopeful and it's going to try and encourage, you know, there's that need of petitioning and the voice of, of caring, you know, um, but there is a building and there's hopes of creating a kind of community center out of it, a space that has a more regular exhibit dedicated to Inner Mountain um, that I'm hopeful for can move forward. As someone, uh, I know some people are familiar with the Phoenix Indian uh, Boarding School that was in the area of downtown Phoenix. They had a project that is comparable of community coming together. The Phoenix Indian Center, Native American Connections was another organization. And they came together to renovate a, a building that used to be this, the band building and renovated it into the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center. Mm -hmm. That is a community center, has an exhibit space for the Phoenix Indian School that was open, you know, practically a century, like a hundred, almost a hundred years or so. And then they have, you know, um, indigenous food sovereignty classes, like activities there, speakers come in. It has a conference room for support for tribal leaders that might be in the area. So I'm really hopeful, especially with the Northwestern Band of Shoshone are based in Brigham City. Hopefully there can be some connections there. And do you see this, uh, this sort of reuse of these spaces? Do you see this as kind of reclaiming a little bit of the... <laughs> the legacy of these places as well? Yes, absolutely, I do. Um, that's what they are. I mean, that was what the project with the Phoenix Indian School was called. It was called, um, well, the Phoenix Indian School Legacy Project. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it was this, it's this act of reclaiming the legacy of the Phoenix Indian School for better or worse. It was our, you know, this is boarding school as a metaphor, as Brenda Child, an Anishinaabe scholar calls it, when you come from this boarding school family or what boarding school means to indigenous peoples and communities who 
were heavily affected by them. It's like, it's a part of our family history. It's, it's a part of who we are. And that's why it's so delicate and very difficult because, you know, even talking to my own dad, um, you know, he doesn't want to be remembered only as a victim. So it's really hard for him and painful, of course, you know, to talk about some of these dark and, and complex aspects of his experiences in boarding school. But at the same time, we do need to know these truths. And that's a part of all these big happenings too, that I, I didn't get to mention earlier, which I should have, to be honest, of uh, the, the Department of the Interior right now being led by Secretary of Interior Deb Holland of Laguna Pueblo, um, who has launched the Federal Indian Boarding School Truth Initiative and collaborating with the National Native American Boarding School Coalition. So there's so much um, very important things in the works. Well, that's that's exciting. I hadn't heard of that. So that, that's, that's great to hear that there's been movement on that front. Um, yeah. One question I have that's, I don't know if it, I'm not quite sure how to frame it, but it seems like in some ways these are ambiguous places in the sense that such great creativity comes out of these. You've got, in many cases, Native instructors, at least by the 1960s and 70s, you've got yes. Native instructors who are playing a role. Yeah. But it's also so thoroughly wrapped up in both overt and, in, in, and inadvertent attempts by the U.S. federal government to just strip people of all the things that make them who they are. Yeah. Um, has that been part of a challenge of this work is threading your oh. way through the ambiguity of a lot of what's happening and happening? Yes, yes. And ambivalence, you know, it's just you're torn in all directions. You have, it's multifaceted. You just have to, you know, navigate multifaceted that um, even one person's story is so mixed, like any human journey, right? We have the days of the tears, the pain, the agonies, anxieties, fear, and the days of beauty and joy and happiness, you know, that's a part of the human experience. And, and yet, you know, we cannot shy away and we have to be honest in forefront and calling out abuse is wrong. You know, that abuse and violence in any form of hurting people who are innocent is wrong. And that abuses happen there, you know, or that even the whole system why did families have to face a choice to send their children miles away? Why were they in that desperate situation? And I know some people, you know, raised the question of did they get any sources of support? Yes, the federal government passed um, a state of declaration, an emergency, a state of emergency for Navajo Nation. And there was the Navajo Hopi Long Range Rehabilitation Act and different funding and support. But there's a deeper and darker intricacies of settler colonialism and that there are ongoing dynamics of um, violence going on that people are not recognizing. And this is a part of some of my upcoming work that I wanna write, um, I am writing, I need to tell myself that. <laughs> I'm writing a work about Navajo healing through generations contextualizing COVID-19 in Navajo Nation. Uh, why did that hit Navajo Nation and Diné? And as we can say, black indigenous people of color communities so hard and disproportionately is this is not a coincidence. It's not you know some kind of special gene. It is different historical dynamics uh, that were really human caused and can be tied to them of disparities, inequities, uh, rep repression, you know, including what you mentioned of what happens when you separate babies from their moms and are teaching them, you know, underlying, even if they're as upfront or underlying messages of they are subpar or subhuman in some way because of the color of their skin or the language that they grew up with, you know, how does that affect a people and how do they then heal over that? You know, that's something I'm grappling with as a descendant of boarding school survivors and my children, you know, my son once asked me, mom, are you going to send me to a boarding school? Because he's learning 
about some of the things I'm doing. And I cannot imagine, you know, having to face the kind of decisions that my ancestors and my parents have had to face. So it's, it is very, very hard, you know, to navigate this and yet know that we have to hold on to that hope, the sehasim that they did. And even Henry Tinhorn, um, I'm kind of reminded and feel prompted to share this. Um, he died after leaving Intermountain. He was a, um, went into Vietnam War and he was killed in Vietnam. And um, a remarkable story in this, Mike would say this the best because this really involved him too. I, uh, Mike and I knew Henry's sister before we knew of Henry Tinhorn and his poetry, or at least I did. I think Mike actually met him while he was researching and learning about Henry Tinhorn, you know, I mentioned, and I knew his sister just from other things in our past, like other, other connections. I didn't know she had this inner mountain connection. Um, and then, you know, we connected with her and learned a little more about Henry and his life and their family life and, and the story. And she shared how she didn't really get to know him that much because he was away at boarding school or she was somewhere. And she did remember that he would write by a kerosene lamp and his writing was so important to him. And so then when we shared with her this project that we're working on and shared with her the poetry of her brother, you know, that was really a powerful moment. Um, and also I was able to share the poetry of Henry with his brother at one of the traveling exhibit presentations. And his brother said, he come, he's coming home through his poetry. Like he's coming home through these writings. And that, you know, to hear um, his sister and her children, they read his poem, poems and poetry. It's like that reconnection for them too and family. That even when there's so much attack and hardship and things like that, what people do, what we do to survive and, and then to thrive, to move forward and, and the beauty and vibrancy that can grow from these very challenging moments. And also, yet also to be aware and call out, we shouldn't have to face all these struggles. You know, how do we really come to recognize and respect all everyone's humanity? Well, and so much of the world we live in really is the product of these past histories. Um, whether we like it or not, there are things that have to be reckoned with as we, we think about what's gonna come next. Um, before we sign off here, I wanted to give Becky a chance to ask any questions that she might have. I wasn't sure if you had any. Um, I, I know you're you're still sitting in, Becky. Um, and if not, that's okay too. I'll 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 sign off. Sure. Uh, trying to turn on my my. Um, you know, I think you know, part of it, you know, is uh, you know we are. You know, many of us are still you know, you know, part of that boarding school survivors, you know, we had our parents and, you know, our brothers and sisters still, and, you know, there are two, um, two uh, boarding schools that our kids still go to today. And, you know, sometimes that's actually out of um, their choice, you know, um, and them wanting to go away, um, either to California or in Oklahoma. And so, you know, boarding schools are, you know, something that is still happening. And, you know, it's, you know, I'm glad that people are doing research on that. And then we also, you know, have to realize that there are many other tribes that were also code talkers as well, you know, Choctaws. Um, and, you know, it's because, and it's exactly what, you know, um, she was saying about, you know, people language, the language isn't written down. And, you know, it's really great to, to actually start thinking about and it's like, you know, how does our language really get written down and, and what, you know, what form are we using like the Latin, you know, part of it as well. And, you know, uh, there are many tribes who are still working on those oral, oral, um, 
stories, but also interviewing elders and, and doing working on just solely the language itself, you know, which is really interesting. But thank you very much for, for um, being on our um, webinar and hopefully as you do the research uh, for, you know, the COVID and having it impacted in um, Navajo um, and maybe throughout parts of Indian country, uh, maybe you can come back again and, and, and do that talk because that would be really interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank oh, you. Oh, so absolutely. Much. No, I agree. And I look forward to it. You were just telling me about the, uh, the project with, with railroads mm -hmm. and Native Americans as well. I really look forward to seeing what you do next and appreciate you sharing what you've been working on with us. Uh, mm -hmm. Once again, we've been speaking with Dr. Farina King, um, a really great presentation. I don't know if you've been following the chat, but people have had wonderful things to say and really appreciate uh, you sharing uh -huh. so much of this history that you're personally connected to uh, with us. So, uh, and I want to say I have a website, farinaking.com. So, if people want to reach me or see other events that are coming up, um, I'm a part of a gathering and symposium that will be held in Ogden, Utah, not that far from that Brigham City country. Um, in, in May 19 to 20, the 19th to the 21st, it's a gathering and symposium on railroads in Native America. And there's so many, yeah, so many different um, events, conversations going on. And thank you so much, uh, Becky, for your points, uh, your, your thoughts and comments. It is true, uh, there are many, um, there's several boarding schools still in operation, including here in Tahlequah, the Sequoia Indian School, and um, how the schools have changed over the years. I mean, there's a need to look at these um, more recent experiences of boarding schools in the 70s and 80s and into the 21st century. I mean, there was a video of break dancing at Inner Mountain and really um, fascinating, you know, a lot, a lot there to continue. So I hope this also encourages people um, to continue learning. And please contact me. I'm sorry we didn't get to all your questions. Thank you for all your questions. I really wish I, I could have responded and in, engaged with all of them. But uh, if you message me or want to follow up or, or attend different things, um, my website, farinaking.com, is a great way to follow. Thank you. Stay well and safe, everyone. Yes, thank you to all of our viewers. And thanks again to uh, Dr. King. We'll see you all next time.